Well, today I am planning to begin the break from the Matthew series and start this series on the great messianic psalms, as I've promised. So that's what we're doing tonight. And for those of you kids who are still kind of learning your way around the Bible, when we talk about the Psalms, we're talking about a part of the Bible, one of the books of the Bible. They're just called the Psalms. It's toward the middle. And those are those Psalms are actually songs. They were originally written to be sung. And the people of God used to sing those back in the day. And sometimes we still do if we have them put to music. But that's basically what they are. They're songs about God and songs sung to God. So when I talk about the Psalms, that's what I'm talking about. And with this series, I'm dealing with some of those Psalms that are more about Jesus, as what we call the Messianic Psalms. So that's what this series is all about. And in the grand tradition of all of my series, this first message is going to be an introduction. I just want to lay out some ideas that I think are important before we really get moving into these Messianic Psalms that I have lined up. So by way of introduction to the whole series, I want to make three points primarily. And so that's going to be the three big things I'm going to talk about tonight, the three points of my outline. First, we should seek to read the Old Testament in a way which is both Christian and credible. And I mean both of those words with equal emphasis, Christian and credible. Secondly, that some of the Messianic Psalms stand out to me as greater than others. And that is the true heart of this introductory message and the true heart of the rest of this series. That some of these Messianic Psalms are greater than others. They are the great Messianic Psalms, so I'm going to talk about them. And then thirdly, as always, we must remember the concept of mystery when studying the Old Testament. It's a concept I've come back to many times just in dealing with the way the New Testament uses the Old Testament. And we have to keep that in mind for the Messianic Psalms as well. Now, the only other note to make here at the beginning, uh, before we get moving, is that you'll notice a change in Bible translation that I am using. Um, I will normally, in these messages, I teach from the ESV, just what I've been doing since I, really since I came here, since I moved back to the Hannibal Quincy area. But for my past studies of these psalms, I've actually put a lot of effort into them in the past, and all of my study was done in the NASB translation. And so I kind of thought about it and just realized that if I try to quote some of these psalms from memory, I'm going to be quoting from the NASB. So I figured I might as well just switch over for this series and just teach from the NASB uh, in terms of just for this psalm series, just to make it easier. I'm afraid it would be confusing to me and to you if I tried to use the ESV for this. So you'll notice that for this series, I'll be using the NASB. And of course, I try to deal with differences in translation anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. Just wanted you to know, just in case you found that kind of strange, yes, I am using the NASB for this series. But to get started with the real meat of things, my first point on the outline here tonight that we should seek to read the Old Testament in a way which is both Christian and credible. That's the first thing I really want to cover. <clears throat> and as you know, I have a great interest in how we interpret the Old Testament. It does make up about three quarters of our Bible. Uh, so that is a very important thing to learn our way around it and how to read it with benefit as a Christian. And some of these points I'm going to make in this first part of the outline are going to be familiar to you. Of course, I'm not, you know, any stranger to this sort of thing, and I've taught about this off and on throughout the Matthew study and even in some other capacities. But I don't think I've ever discussed it quite this way, not in this exact fashion as I'm going to do now. So, uh, I don't know, it might be kind of a different way to approach this whole issue of reading the New Testament. And in this case, the big phrase is we should read the Old Testament in a way that is both Christian and credible. And I think we need to think along those lines as we come to the Old Testament and try to interpret it as Christians, whether we're in the Psalms or anywhere else in the Old Testament. So first of all, the Christian part of that statement, that if we truly believe the Old Testament testifies to Jesus, we should be willing to read it that way and use it in that way. That is what I mean by a Christian interpretation of the Old Testament, 
that is just consistent with our belief that it testifies to Jesus, and that is going to affect how we read it and how we use it. Now, in the field of Bible interpretation, there is much discussion on this point of how to read the Old Testament. You know, every time you get around to this idea in your hermeneutics classes in a seminary or a college, your Bible interpretation classes, there's always quite a bit to say on this. There are whole classes on this and whole books written on this, so you can specialize in this kind of knowledge if you want to. There's just a lot to say about it. Now, some Christians have said that we, who, uh, we Christians who read the Old Testament and try to teach from it, that we should study and teach the Old Testament exactly as a Jewish rabbi would study and teach the Old Testament. And that should be our standard for how we approach any kind of Old Testament study. We should do it exactly the way you would hear it taught, maybe in a synagogue, if you were to go there today and hear a rabbi teach on it. That's how your use and your reading of the Old Testament should look. Now, the great problem with that view is, I am not a Jewish rabbi, and neither are any of you. We are not Jews. We are very much Christians, and we claim that, and we have very much you know, brought that to the center of our lives for who we are as people. We are Christians. And if I were to read the Old Testament while pretending to be something I am not, I am both a fool and a liar. I am a fool because I am ignoring reality, and I'm a liar because I'm deliberately ignoring reality. To approach the Old Testament as anything other than a Christian is both foolish and dishonest. The only consistent and honest way for me to read the Old Testament is as a Christian. There's no way around that. If I'm going to be truly sincere in my reading of the Old Testament, I have to do it in that way. Now, I am greatly strengthened in my conviction on this point by the Bible itself. I can actually go to the pages of Scripture to give me reasons for why I should read the Old Testament, not as a Jewish rabbi, but as a Christian. Because the Christians in the New Testament certainly use the Old Testament in a way that only Christians would. When you go through the pages of the New Testament and you see them quoting the Old Testament and drawing points from it, they certainly act and sound like Christians as they're doing that. Now as an example, I have chosen a quotation of one of the Psalms we'll be covering later on in this series, which is Psalm 16, which we'll get to about halfway through this series. And Peter quotes this psalm in Acts chapter 2, and he uses it like no Jewish rabbi ever would. So I want you to read part of this sermon from the day of Pentecost and just listen to how he makes use of this Old Testament passage. And you tell me if he sounds like a Jewish rabbi or not. Acts chapter 2, verse 22, that's where I'm going to start reading. This again is on his Pentecost sermon. He says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held by its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Now, how many Jewish rabbis would preach on Psalm 16 and make the argument that it's about Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. Jesus' Jesus's resurrection from the dead. How many people in a synagogue have ever heard a sermon like that? Well, never, except for back here in the New Testament period where the Christians were going around teaching these things in the synagogues. The point is very simple, but somehow it has become very obscured in some 
uh, minds of some Christians. But if we truly believe the Old Testament, and if we believe that it testifies to Jesus, we should be willing to read it and use it in that way, in an authentically Christian way. We should be willing to open up the Old Testament, whether the Psalms or some other part of it, and just read it like a Christian, understand it like a Christian would, and use it the way a Christian would. In that way, it's a very Christian reading of the Old Testament. And that's one half of this phrase I want you to have in your mind. Christian and credible, which is my next point on this, that we must also interpret the Old Testament in a way that is credible, in a way that is believable. That is, we must also be able to prove that the Old Testament is indeed a witness to Jesus. We must be able to make a convincing argument for that case. Now, this, I think, is the place where Christians have more often failed. I think most Christians would read the Old Testament as Christians and not be dissuaded from that. But I think this credible side of things is where things tend to go wrong. We often forget, we tend to think that we are the only people that actually read the Old Testament. We sort of think of it as being our exclusive property and no one else really bothers with it. But we forget about the Jews who still read the Old Testament and think that our use of it is silly. You know, the Jews who sometimes actually write books refuting the way Christians interpret the Old Testament. And I have seen such books. They are out there. We forget that those people do exist. And we're not the only ones reading the Old Testament. We also forget about the scholars who study the Old Testament like others might study mythology. Like you might study Greek myth or maybe Hindu mythology. And they sort of study it in this academic way. And they too kind of laugh at this idea that it has anything to do with Jesus. After all, it's just kind of the mythology of Israel. And uh, the Christians just kind of came along and commandeered it for their own purposes. And that's the way they view it. They read the Old Testament as well. And we should not be forgetting about that. And at this point, the great task given to us as Christians is to use the Old Testament in the way it was intended. To incite faith in Christ. To take it and use it in such a way that these groups that are not really convinced by it become convinced by it and become convinced that it does witness to Jesus as the Messiah. We're supposed to go to the Jewish rabbi and show him that his own scriptures testify that Jesus Christ really was the Christ. He really was the Messiah of Israel. And we're supposed to go to the pages of his own scripture to show him that. Also, we're meant to show the skeptical scholar that the Old Testament really does prepare the way for Jesus of Nazareth and that it really is the word of God which God himself gave to predict and foreshadow Jesus, his son. Our opening of the Old Testament should close the mouths of unbelievers. It should leave them speechless when we actually open to pages of the Old Testament and quote it and make an argument from it that it refers to Jesus. Unfortunately, I think Christians have largely not bothered to develop the skill of arguing from the Old Testament. We haven't really cultivated that very much just in our own reading of the Old Testament and as we talk about it. It is simply not enough to be 100% Christian in our personal reading of the Old Testament. <clears throat> it sure is great when you open up the Old Testament and you read it and you get benefit from it on your own time, but what about these instances where we must argue coherently and convincingly why we think the Old Testament truly testifies to Jesus when there are people saying that it doesn't, when there are people arguing that it does not. We really need to have that skill when we are called to make use of it. Furthermore, I would also argue that being able to do that, being able to make that kind of credible interpretation of the Old Testament will only enrich your personal reading of it. As you yourself learn to make these sorts of Christological arguments, these arguments for Jesus from the Old Testament, you will learn to see more in the Old Testament and you'll actually be better off for it in your own personal reading. So really not even because of the argument we have to make sometimes with other people, but for our own sakes, this is a good thing. This is why we must learn to prove from the Old Testament that it is indeed a witness to Jesus. We must be able to present this credible reading of the Old Testament. It'll help us in our dealing with some unbelievers for sure, but it will also help us understand our own scriptures better. So that's what I mean by a Christian and credible reading of the Old Testament. 
But we're not quite done on this. We have one more thing to make here on this first point. And that is we must practice this Christian incredible reading throughout the Old Testament. We have to cover a lot of ground here. See, the temptation is to think that only the prophets testify of Christ. We think of, you know, the preparing of the way for Jesus as being a very prophetic thing. And so you think of guys like Isaiah, you know, guys like Jeremiah, maybe the minor prophets. But in reality, it's so much more than that. It really does extend to the entire Old Testament including the Psalms, hence the Messianic Psalms, and all of this contains some witness to Jesus throughout its pages. I just want to give you some places here where this is modeled for us. First of all, you have Jesus himself modeling this for us. If you remember, there was that conversation Jesus had with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. You know, this was after he was already risen from the dead. He gets to walking with these two guys who were disciples of his, and he gets to talking about them, and they show a real lack of knowledge of what to expect from the Messiah. And he says in Luke 24, verse 25, he says, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. So he doesn't really start properly with the prophets. He starts with Moses. He starts there. And these men who have no idea what the Old Testament really says about the Messiah are instructed from Moses and all the prophets about the true uh, teaching about the Messiah and his mission and what he was going to suffer and do. Now, on the one hand, it's entirely Christian, right, because it's about Jesus. But, of course, on the other hand, it's meant to appeal to their understanding. He's trying to explain to them. They're like, oh, we thought Jesus was going to be the Messiah, but then they kill them and crucify him. And Jesus is like, well, wait, look, back here in the Old Testament, or they would say the scriptures, not the Old Testament back then, they would say, look, in the scriptures, you see this sort of thing. He's appealing to their reason to make them understand this. And that covers Moses and the prophets. Well, what about the Psalms? It's kind of important for this series in front of us. Well, you go a little later in the chapter, Jesus shows up to the other disciples. And in verse 44, he says, these are my words which I spoke to you, while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So yeah, it includes the Psalms too. Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, throughout the Old Testament scriptures, you see Jesus very much advocating this idea that it really does testify to him throughout it. So Jesus models for us this kind of Christian and credible reading of the entire Old Testament. But we have another example, and this is one that I refer to far more often actually, because the context is a little more, uh, a little more similar to what I have in mind, and that is Paul. The Apostle Paul models this for us as well. And there is a story in Acts chapter 28 that I want to read where you see him do this. This is when he's under house arrest in Rome. Acts 28 verse 17. After three days, Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews. And when they came together, he began saying to them, Brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they were willing to release me because there was no ground for putting me to death. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had any accusation against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. They said to him, We have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren come here and reported or spoken anything bad about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are concerning this sect. It is known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. And by this sect, they mean Christianity, of course. When they had set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers. And he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus. From both the law, both the law of Moses and from the prophets, from morning until evening, some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others would not believe. So that's the situation there that you have with Paul. So Paul, 
draws from the law of Moses and the prophets. So he's covering a lot of ground there in the Old Testament. And on the one hand, it was a completely Christian sermon. It was concerning Jesus. He was trying to show them from the Old Testament these things about Jesus. But on the other hand, it was also credible. <clears throat> it was meant to be persuasive. He was trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from the Old Testament. And some actually were persuaded. They said, yes, that's a convincing argument. I never saw that passage in that way before. But you're right, Paul. That really does seem to talk about this guy, Jesus. So Paul also models for us this Christian and credible reading of the entire Old Testament. He gives a morning through evening sermon on it. He goes for 12 hours about in this one ream, just showing you from the Old Testament Jesus and making arguments that he is the Messiah. There's one more example I want to show you. This one can be very easily overlooked, and that is the example of the Bereans. You have this incident in Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 12, during Paul's missionary activity. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word of God with eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. So, you have these Bereans examining the Old Testament scriptures to, to prove the things that Paul and Silas were preaching to them about Jesus. So you don't have to be Jesus or Paul to search the Old Testament for the gospel. And I make that point specifically because some Christians actually think that you have to be Jesus or Paul in order to read the Old Testament in this way. They will tell you that really only these men back in the first century who were gifted in this way to read the Old Testament like that. Uh, <laughs> you have Jude poking around outside for some reason. Uh, <laughs> there, <laughs> Gary's out there. Sorry, I just thought you might want to uh, be mindful of that. Anyway, you have some Christians who actually do believe that you know, Jesus could do this, Paul could do this, Peter could do this. The people living back then, you know, they were empowered by God to see Jesus in the Old Testament. But we can't do that, so we just have to take their word for it. Well, here you have just people who, at this point, aren't even really believers. I mean, they're still testing the gospel. They're still trying to figure out whether it's actually true or not. You get the idea they want it to be true, but they're not going to believe this until they show it from the scriptures to themselves. And yet these people were able to do that. They were able to actually test these things. It's not some special spiritual gift. It's just a matter of, are you willing to open the Old Testament and say, and ask the question, is this talking about Jesus? Is this psalm only properly explained by a messianic interpretation? That's all it's required. It's not some special spiritual thing. It's just a matter of whether you're willing to read it and ask that question. So you can see from the New Testament that this is the ideal, though. We should be able to go from passage to passage through every division of the Old Testament, arguing for the gospel of Jesus Christ the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, throughout the whole thing, making an argument that can even persuade unbelievers that Jesus is the Messiah. That is the ideal you see in the Old Testament. And this series on the great Messianic Psalms is part of the effort to forge a Christian and credible reading of the entire Old Testament. It's very much focused on one division of the Old Testament, but uh, through Matthew we've been dealing with a lot. I wanted to target more on the Psalms, so here we go with this. Let's get on with this. The Psalms, in particular, as a witness to Jesus as the Messiah. And when we come to this, here's my second point of the outline. That some of the Messianic Psalms stand out to me as greater than others. And yes, I have the audacity to make that statement, to uh, go through the Psalms and say, this one seems... You know, greater to me, this one seems greater to me, which is, I admit, kind of a risky thing to do. And yet, nonetheless, that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to kind of uh, cherry pick some psalms here that I want to use in this series. And that is where the series gets its name, the Great Messianic Psalms. I've labeled some of them as being greater than others. Now, to begin this, I want to define my key phrase here, which really is Messianic Psalms. And Messianic psalm, I mean something very specific by this. I mean a psalm which deliberately and specifically 
discusses the person and work of the Messiah. That is what I mean when I say Messianic Psalm. It is a psalm which deliberately and specifically discusses the person and work of the Messiah. Now I consider that definition necessary because of the way Christians sometimes treat the Old Testament. You have Christians sometimes that come back here and they say, oh, well, it's all about Jesus. So every psalm is a messianic psalm, right? I mean, didn't I just make the argument that the Old Testament throughout its entirety testifies of Jesus? So some Christians say, well, it's all about Jesus. Every psalm is about Jesus. Therefore, every psalm is a messianic psalm. Now, on the one hand, you might think I'd have no problem with that reasoning because after all, I'm trying to encourage you to read the Old Testament with a Christ-centered focus. That said, some of these psalms speak way more about Jesus than others. I mean, some of them, they are indirect at best, you know, getting to Jesus. But some of them speak very directly about the person and work of Jesus as the Christ. So I do think it's important to separate some of the psalms as being messianic psalms and not just make this kind of lazy statement that all psalms are messianic. Hey, you know, no need to bother specifying them. No, we're going to do that. We're going we're to treat some psalms as being messianic psalms and others as not messianic. Now, my way of doing that is found in my definition. A messianic psalm is a psalm which deliberately and specifically discusses the person and work of the Messiah. That is how I divide the messianic psalms from the other psalms. So when I say a messianic psalm, I do not mean a psalm which describes you know, righteous people in general. And then you kind of say, well, Jesus is the most righteous person ever. So this psalm about righteous people is actually about him. No, we're not talking about that. That's a very general, very indirect way of getting to Jesus through these psalms. When I say a messianic psalm, I mean a psalm which deliberately and specifically discusses the person and work of the Messiah, which means the author of that psalm decided to write about the Messiah and also decided to write chiefly about the Messiah. Whenever the author of one of these psalms sat down, he had the Messiah on his mind, and he wrote things about the Messiah because he wanted people to know things about the Messiah, and therefore he wrote this psalm. That's what I mean by a messianic psalm. So I'm using this phrase in a very specific way and not in the kind of generic way that a lot of Christians often do. Okay, but as for these Messianic Psalms, kind of moving along here in this uh, point of the outline, many of them are quoted in the New Testament and are applied directly to Jesus or in his accomplishments. You actually see these Psalms show up, whether quoted word for word or strongly alluded to in the pages of the New Testament. Now, I do not wish to create the impression that we are limited by what the New Testament tells us. I'm not trying to impose a limitation here on how we discover these Messianic Psalms. Uh, I'm not trying to do that at all. I myself think that some Psalms are Messianic, even though the New Testament never actually uses them that way. I do think you go back here <coughs> to the Psalms and identify some of them as being Messianic, even though there's no New Testament author that identified them as such. For example, Psalm 24. You know, a lot of Christians have read Psalm 24, you know, that is, you know, be lifted up, O gates, be lifted up, O everlasting doors. You know, who is this king of glory, you know, coming in? Well, a lot of Christians have interpreted that as being about Christ and about his ascension, even though the New Testament never actually uses it that way. I think that's fair. I think that's fair for Psalm 24. I think that's fair for some other Psalms that I've discovered that I think really are messianic. So I don't think we're limited to a list of Psalms quoted in the New Testament and applied to Jesus. That's not my point. My point is that we can look at the New Testament and begin to compile a pretty good list of Messianic Psalms. If you want to start your list of Messianic Psalms, Psalms about Jesus, go through the New Testament and see which ones they use to talk about Jesus, and there's your starting point. That list would also tell us, among other things, which Psalms were important to the earliest Christians as they themselves began to discover Jesus in the Old Testament. Don't forget, back then, those Christians were just Christians. You know, they meditated on Scripture too. You know, they themselves were sort of at the beginning. You know, at the beginning of their knowledge, certainly as Christians, but the beginning of the church's knowledge. They didn't have the 2,000 years of helpful teaching that you have had. 
So they're going through the Psalms and they're reading them, and they're thinking to themselves, hey, is this messianic? You know, do you think Psalm 2 is about Jesus? Do you think Psalm 16 is about Jesus? What about this one over here? They're trying to figure this stuff out. They really are. And so you can see them, the Psalms that they themselves kind of flagged as being messianic, the Psalms they themselves found helpful in using with their debates with Jews, you know, trying to show that Jesus really is, that Jesus in particular really is predicted in the Old Testament. You see that kind of thing as you go through the New Testament and see what Psalms they use in that way. Now, my own count of such Psalms is about 24. I just kind of did my own count of them, and I'm not necessarily willing to make a firm statement on all of them. Some of these things get a little bit tricky when you get into the particulars of them. But if you're saying, stand about how many have you seen, how many Psalms have been specifically used in the New Testament to make a statement about Jesus, I would say about 24 is what I've seen. And then if you want to ask me how many have I seen, how many Psalms have I seen that are not used in the New Testament, but which seem to be Messianic Psalms, I would say I've seen about four. I'd be willing to argue for about four of them. So, and about 28 Messianic Psalms is what I've seen that I'd be comfortable identifying as such. That's basically where I am. So out of 150 Psalms, you know, my definition of a Messianic Psalm is very much limited to about 28 right now. And there's probably more I have yet to see. So uh, the number's probably going to go up somewhat. But that gives you an idea of how I kind of limit this term Messianic Psalms. Now you'll be glad to know I have decided not to dedicate this series on all 28 of those Psalms that I would consider Messianic. We're going to narrow it down very much. And that's where we get to this true idea of the, what I call the great Messianic Psalms. And that is that a few of these Messianic Psalms used in the, used in the New Testament seem to have greater usefulness. <clears throat> Excuse me. A few of these Messianic Psalms used in the New Testament seem to have greater usefulness. And by greater usefulness, I mean greater usefulness in making a credible argument that Jesus is the Christ. And this is where I get to the real essence of this series on the great Messianic Psalms. My exact reason for saying uh, why this psalm is a great psalm, why it has greater usefulness, that is going to depend, that is going to go from psalm to psalm. Each psalm is a little bit different. For these five or six psalms that I'll eventually put in this series, I have different reasons for each of them. I will talk about that as I get there. What I can tell you right now is there are you know, a handful of these psalms that I consider to be of greater usefulness. I consider them to be the greater messianic psalms. Just to give you a list, there's Psalm 2, which is the one that begins, Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? You know, you are my son, today I have begotten you, that psalm. Then you have Psalm 16, I think is also one of these greater psalms. This is the psalm which I read earlier that Peter used on the day of Pentecost to speak specifically of the resurrection of Jesus. Then you have Psalm 22. This is the one that begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And provides the very vivid portrait of the sufferings of the Messiah. Then you have Psalm 45, which is the wedding psalm, the one that's very much taking the flavor of a royal wedding. Whenever we get there, you'll see what I mean by that. You also have Psalm 69. This one is interesting. It contains a variety of phrases that we very often associate with Jesus. For example, zeal for your house has consumed me, which is what was said of him during the cleansing of the temple. And then you have, they gave me sour wine to drink, you know, during his uh, crucifixion. You see that. You see Psalm 69, one of these greater Psalms. You see Psalm 110, the one that begins with, the Lord says to my Lord, you know, Yahweh says to my Lord. This is the one Jesus himself quotes, so it sounds kind of important. And then Psalm 118. This is another psalm which contains just familiar phrases. The stone, <clears throat> the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That's from Psalm 118. Then you have, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Psalm 118. You have these phrases in that one that seem to refer very often to Jesus in the New Testament. So I gave you a total there of seven, actually. I actually gave you a list of seven psalms, which I have come to call in my own mind the great messianic psalms. And I have my reasons for each of them. And you'll see that with most of them, 
Not, however, all of them because I am kind of picking and choosing even among those to make this a little more difficult on you. To be honest, I only plan to teach on maybe five or six of these. Now, the one that I am certainly not going to teach on, just to give you a heads up on this, on that list, I will certainly not be teaching on Psalm 69. I do consider it one of these greater messianic psalms. I do think it's very important. But the reason I'm not going to teach on it in this series is because I do not feel like I understand it well enough to teach on it. There's a lot in that psalm that really throws me off, and I'm still trying to figure it out. So I don't want to get up here and pretend that I know all about it when, in fact, I'm still kind of figuring it out. So unfortunately, I have to take one of these great messianic psalms and lay it aside and not include it in this series. So uh, too bad for Psalm 69. Another psalm, the one that I'm kind of undecided on, is Psalm 118. I might teach on Psalm 118. I might not teach on Psalm 118. And the reason there is I think I could teach on it. I just don't know if I want to. I want to see if it's really going to add anything to this series as a whole. And if it does, I'll teach on it. Otherwise, I'll just kind of let it go. So really what we have here is five or six psalms that I really want to teach on as part of this series on the great messianic psalms. And to give them to you in order, in case you're wondering, we're going to start with Psalm 110, then go to Psalm 45, then Psalm 22, then Psalm 16, and then Psalm 2, which I just realized is actually going backwards through the psalms. <laughs> I'm uh, actually going in kind of reverse order here. But Psalm 110, Psalm 45, Psalm 22, Psalm 16, and then Psalm 2. So those are the five uh, great Messianic Psalms that I will certainly teach on. Psalm 118 might get thrown in there at the end. Psalm 69, not going to be part of this series, unfortunately. But I hope to show you that each of these Psalms, when studied, supports the gospel of Jesus Christ in a very great and useful way. I want to really show you how these Psalms really do stand out among the other, even among the other Messianic Psalms. They really do stand out and really help you see the gospel of Jesus Christ in the pages of the Old Testament. And in general, I have three goals for each psalm. So three things that I'll really be trying to do for each of these. First, I will try to prove that the psalm is, in fact, messianic. I'm actually going to make an argument that this psalm really was intended to be about the Messiah. And I will prove that from the psalm itself or from the rest of the Old Testament. For making that argument, the New Testament is off limits because at that time they didn't have the New Testament. You know, they just had the Old Testament and they had to argue from that. So I'm going to try to make the argument like they had to make it back then. I'm going to try to prove that that psalm really is messianic. Secondly, I will show how Jesus fulfills the expectations of that psalm. We'll do a comparison. We'll say, see, look, here's what this psalm says about the Messiah. Here's what happened in the life of Jesus. They match. You see, Jesus fulfilled the expectation of this Messianic Psalm, and this Messianic Psalm, and this Messianic Psalm, and this Messianic Psalm, and this Messianic Psalm as well. And by the time you're done, you're going to be thinking to yourself, how can Jesus not be the Messiah when he fulfills so much? So we're going to show you how Jesus actually fulfills those expectations in those Messianic Psalms. And then third and final thing I want to do for each Psalm, I will demonstrate other points of Christian truth from that psalm to show you how the early church began to formulate its doctrine. And that is probably one of the more interesting points of all this because it really is taking us back to how the early church learned things. I mean, we often think of it as just God beaming things into their heads, but no, I mean, these people were reading the Old Testament. They were thinking about it in a new way. Now that they saw that the Messiah had come, that Jesus was the Messiah, they're going to bring a whole new lens for the reading of the Old Testament. And they're going to get things out of it that they didn't see before. And they're going to start developing uniquely Christian doctrines from the pages of the Old Testament. From the Jewish scriptures come forth Christian doctrine. And I want to show you that as part of this because very often they are tied to seeing Jesus in the Messianic Psalms. They're very often linked. So I want to show you that as well. So those are the three goals I really have. Show you the psalm is messianic, show you Jesus fulfills the expectations, and then finally show you how other points of Christian doctrine 
arose from these Messianic Psalms. Now, in a perfect world, every sermon in this series would have a three-point outline corresponding to those three goals. And you'd be able to follow it easily each time, and there'd never be a problem. Well, guess what? It is not a perfect world, and I am in the very least not a perfect teacher, and so we're not going to have anything that neat or tidy. So don't expect the three-point outline each time with each point corresponding to all of those. But I do hope that each goal is met by each message. I may have four or five points, but the three goals are all still there. So be looking for those things. I will be pointing them out to you, but still have in mind those three goals. For each psalm, we're going to prove it's messianic. We're going to show you Jesus fulfills the expectations for that psalm. And we're going to show you other points of Christian doctrine from that psalm. <clears throat> and by the time we cover that, we will have a good Old Testament argument for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will have a Christian, credible interpretation of those five or six Messianic Psalms. Paul, in Acts 28, argued for about 12 hours, right? He argued from morning to evening with those Jews, trying to persuade them from the Old Testament that Jesus was the Messiah. Well, in this series, you're going to get five or six hours of argument. So you're going to be about halfway there. we will be about halfway to doing what Paul himself was able to do with those Jews in Acts 28. So I'm taking you halfway there. Hopefully with the Matthew series, you can go the other half because there's been a lot there too. But by the time we're done with this series, you'll have a substantial argument to make from the pages of the Old Testament that Jesus is the Messiah. That is really the great goal. <clears throat> okay, before leaving this introduction, I do have a third point. I wanted to remind you of the importance of mystery as we study the Old Testament in a manner which is both Christian and credible. So the importance of the concept of mystery. Now I've discussed this before. It comes up probably every time I go into any kind of depth about how a New Testament author uses the Old Testament, specifically Matthew. Um, so this is not at all a strange thing, not at all a new thing. But I want to remind you of it before the rest of this series because it's very much going to be a factor in the rest of this series. <clears throat> the New Testament directs us to see the Old Testament as a mysterious witness for Jesus. Not just a witness to Jesus, but a mysterious witness to Jesus. Now, to explain what I mean by that, let's talk about the dilemma faced by the earliest Christians. Because the first Christians really did have a kind of problem where they were caught on the horns of what seemed like two bad options. On the one hand, they believed that the Old Testament truly did provide an argument that Jesus was the Messiah. They themselves have come to see Jesus in the pages of the Old Testament. He really is there. On the other hand, it seems like practically no one was waiting for a Messiah like Jesus, and relatively few people recognized Jesus as the Messiah when he came. Most of the Jews, most of the people who had the Old Testament, who had the Messianic Psalms, were not waiting for a Messiah like Jesus. And so when Jesus showed up and started doing things, hardly any of them believed in Jesus. That's a huge problem. So how can both facts be true? How can you say the Old Testament really does testify to Jesus, and yet no one reads the Old Testament and walks away saying, oh, Jesus is the Messiah? I mean, how do you believe both things? That's a dilemma. Well, the earliest Christians answered this dilemma with the concept of mystery. That is how they got out of this dilemma. They said, yes, the Old Testament truly does provide an argument that Jesus is the Messiah. And if you go back there with an open mind and an open heart, and you go reading those things, and you go testing Jesus against the Old Testament, you will see him there. However, they also believed that the Old Testament provided that argument in ways which were relatively unclear, in ways which were somewhat secretive, ways which were somewhat mysterious, which is where we're getting this word mystery. And it is that lack of clarity which allowed most people to miss the gospel truths taught in the Old Testament. They really were there, but they were taught in such a way that you're going to miss them. They're like riddles you can't get. And because you can't get the riddle, you can't get the truth. 
and because the gospel is hidden in that riddle, you're not getting it. That's what we mean by mystery. The Christians referred to all of this as the concept of mystery. And that's how they answered that dilemma. Now you have a very standard presentation of that idea at the very end of Paul's letter to the Romans. So I'll read that briefly. Romans 16, verses 25 through 27. He kind of gives this benediction here. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has long been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God has been made known to all the nations, leading to the obedience of faith, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, be glory forever, amen. In true Pauline fashion, he uh, packs a lot of stuff in his concluding benediction as he's thanking God there. But basically he says on the one hand that the Old Testament is a witness to the gospel. He says that it's been manifested by the scriptures of the prophets. You can go back to the prophetic scriptures and see Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ there. But he also says on the other hand that this gospel was the revelation of a mystery long kept secret. Even though they had the Old Testament scriptures and all these prophecies, even though they had them, it was still a secret. The scriptures were secretive. And it wasn't until this time when that mystery was finally revealed. It's like, I've, I've used this analogy many times, but I'm going to use it again because it's the perfect one. I can't think of a better one. Let's say someone tells you a riddle, and you're trying to figure this out, and you're just like, I just can't get it. I feel like I should know the answer to this riddle. And then he tells you the answer to the riddle, and then you say, oh, okay. And you start working back through the riddle, and now you see what it means. You see it perfectly. And then you're like, how could I never get that before? Why couldn't I understand it before? It was all there. It was all right in front of me. Well, that's how the Old Testament is, and that's how mystery works. They had it all right there in front of them, but they just couldn't get it. And then Jesus shows up, <clears throat> and so long as you haven't closed your heart entirely to the gospel, you're going to go back to the Old Testament. You're going to go back to the riddle, and you're going to say, huh, now I see it. That's what the Bereans were doing in Acts 17. You know, they heard this word of this person, Jesus. They were more noble-minded than other Jews were at that time. And they said, hey, we're going to look into this. And as they start looking at it, they're like, yeah, we see it. We see Jesus back here. This makes sense. They got the riddle after they had the answer. So when Jesus shows up, the veil that's kind of there over the Old Testament gets lifted, and they're able to read it now, so long as you have a heart that is willing to believe these things and not just close-minded like so many were, like the scribes and the Pharisees and the crowds who wanted their great conqueror Messiah and all those things. That's the concept of mystery, and that's how it works. Now, just in case you see that as a little bit too convenient, I can also tell you that the Old Testament itself actually encourages us to read it in a mysterious way. We're not imposing some standard on the Old Testament to make it fit with Christianity. Rather, the Old Testament itself actually indicates in various ways you're supposed to have this expectation that there's stuff here you're not going to get until the days of fulfillment, or that the Old Testament is at least speaking indirectly to you. And again, I've made this case <clears throat> many times before. I've used various different passages to do this, I want to point to one that we encountered recently in the Matthew study. This one actually is a psalm, so it's fitting uh, for this series. Psalm 78. This was back in Matthew 13 that we encountered this. Psalm 78, the first few verses. Listen to how he begins his psalm. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, <clears throat> dark sayings of old, which we have heard from, which we have heard and known, and which our fathers have told us. So my psalm contains dark sayings. It's the same word usually translated riddle throughout the Old Testament, which is why I keep coming back to this concept of riddle. Dark sayings. The psalmist here tells you at the very beginning of his psalm that he's going to give you something dark, not clear, not plain, but dark. Riddlesome. You're going to have to think about this one pretty carefully. So don't be surprised if other psalms are that way. If, say, maybe <clears throat> the Messianic psalms, 
come at you from a perspective that you're not going to get right away. But once Jesus comes, now they become unlocked to you, and now you can read them and see the Messiah there. And not just the Messiah, but Jesus himself. Don't be surprised if the Messianic Psalms work like that, because some Psalms do. The Old Testament, in, its general, in general, is meant to be that way. <clears throat> and various other passages make indications like that. I just wanted to give you the one, because I've been through all this before. Just one passage there for this particular series to make that point. This is not just a convenient explanation that Christians have for why they read the Old Testament the way they do. This is true to the nature of the Old Testament. This is how it was meant to be read. It is also very important for this series because without this concept of mystery, we are not going to be able to build these messianic interpretations of these Psalms and to make these arguments that they refer to Jesus. We're not going to be able to do that without the concept of mystery. I would love it. It'd be wonderful if the task were easy, if it were plain, if it were clear. If you could go back to the Psalms and just kind of flip around, read a few verses and say, see, look, Jesus is the Messiah. It's easy. Everyone can see that. I would love it if it were that way. But it just doesn't work that way. God has buried Jesus in pages of mystery. He has given us a word that is not entirely plain, a word that was meant to hide a secret until the right time when that secret would go forth and a secret which would require explanation to be made known. Jesus explaining things to those disciples on the road to Emmaus. Paul arguing with those Jews. It has to be done like that. It's not just flip around and say, hey, look, Jesus, hey, done. It doesn't work that way. It's going to require these kinds of long arguments I'm going to make, where I ask you to sit there and just think about that. Think about this word. Think about this detail. Why would he say that? Why not say this? How does this connect to this other psalm? It's questions like that. You've got to sit there and think. It's like a Rubik's Cube. You've got to sit there and work with it before it actually becomes what it needs to be. That's how all these sermons are going to be. <clears throat> the Messianic Psalms approach us in a way that is very indirect because they are meant to be mysterious. And we have to bear that in mind. Otherwise, this isn't going to work. This is the way it was meant to work. We have to approach these Psalms in that way. There is no quick and easy answer here. You want to see Jesus in the Old Testament? Get out the magnifying glass. No other way. <clears throat> and that is my introductory message for this series. Let me go ahead and give you the bullet points again, and then we'll be done. First of all, I just made the point that we should seek to read the Old Testament in a way which is both Christian and credible. I consider that a delicate balance, but we must do both. We must be thoroughly Christian, and yet we must be able to persuade with credibility as we make these arguments. Secondly, some of the Messianic Psalms stand out to me as greater than others. And I have various reasons for that, and I'll get to those as we go to each Psalm. But there are great Messianic Psalms that I have in mind. And those are going to be the Psalms that I talk about in this series. At least five, maybe six. And then finally, as always, we must remember the concept of mystery when studying the Old Testament. We're coming to a puzzle box. We're coming to a riddle. And we have to treat it accordingly, or we are not going to see what God wants us to see there. <clears throat> so that's all I have to say. The next time I speak, I'll be speaking on Psalm 110. Uh, that's where we begin the actual exegesis of these psalms. <clears throat> okay. Are there questions regarding this introduction or of a general nature uh, that I can answer? Um, answers on the Psalms that I listed off for you, I can answer later. <clears throat> but uh, any kind of questions on this tonight? <clears throat>